hello good morning good afternoon and good evening to all our speakers chairs and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world welcome back to icns webinars let me start today's webinar by wishing our honorable colleagues in china a very very happy chinese new year coming back to our webinars the speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from japan professor manabuki noshita professor kinoshita is a professor and chairman in neurosurgery at the asai ka medical university hokkaido japan He was the previous director of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Osaka International Cancer Institute. His clinical interests are focused upon surgical neuro-oncology and his main clinical research activities are performed at uh, Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine. He is an expert on operating malignant brain tumor surgeries including awake surgeries for glioma. He has also been participating in MR guided focus ultrasound surgery and demonstrated for the first time that macromolecules such as antibodies could be delivered beyond the blood brain barrier in a site specific fashion by MR guided micro bubble enhanced focus ultrasound. We are extremely honored to him today at our webinars and today he'll be talking about surgical neuroanatomy aiming glioma surgery the speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from china professor gu wentao professor wentao is a professor of neurosurgery at the huashan hospital for dang university shanghai china he did his research scholarship training from the harvard medical school and he associated the national natural science youth foundation project to one provincial and ministerial level project and published several papers in various peer reviewed journals his clinical interests are focused in the diagnosis and microsurgical treatment of common diseases of neurosurgery as well as spinal cord disease and spine diseases we are extremely honored to him today at our webinars and today he'll be talking about sir microsurgical management of spinal cord hemangioblastomas the chair for the second session of today is our distinguished faculty from brazil professor ferestad nato professor nato is a professor and head of neurosurgery at the department of federal university of sao paulo unifes brazil he is head of vascular neurosurgery sector at the unifes and also heads the micro neurosurgical anatomy laboratory at the unifes he is responsible for specialization and improvement program in vascular and neurosurgery for neurosurgeons from all over the world he did his postdoc under the guidance of professor albert rotten and also under professor ivandro de oliveira he is an integral part of brazilian society of neurosurgery and full member of brazilian academy of neurosurgery his he has his affiliations with the ans as well as cns he is a noted author with several publications in various peer journals and we are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of professor kinoshita on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president of the okokato i would like to welcome both the speakers chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of acns webinars We are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Ferestad Nato. Thank you, uh, Haji. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good morning here in Brazil. Here it's 9:30 a.m. It's a great honor to be here in Brazil. Here it's 9:30 a.m. It's a great honor and pleasure to me be part of this webinar. Uh, first off. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Professor Yoko Kato and you for the invitation. Uh, nowadays, it's so important to have a person like Professor Yoko Kato, uh, who dedicates part of time to teach and develop knowledge for young neurosurgeons uh, in order to improve outcomes for the patients. So thank you for giving this opportunity uh, for all of us. Brain tumors, especially uh, gliomas, uh, represent a huge challenge. Uh, classifications are changing in the last decades, and molecular and gene treatments have uh, emerged as a hope of uh, for the cure. Uh, however, surgery still remains the cornerstone in the treatment uh, of the kind of tumors. As we know, supertotal resection offers a better overall survival and progression-free survival, uh, while subtotal or partial uh, resection are worse ones. Uh, but at the same time, morbidity generated by the surgeon trying to reach supertotal resection are related to worse outcomes. Uh, technology is our ally in this battle against gliomas, uh, MRI, DTI, tractography, uh, PET, uh, uh, PET imaging, and neuronavigation have became 
uh, uh, great tools in planning and determining how much we can uh, 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 resect safely. But these tools are not always available around the world. In these situations, uh, we must rely on the basics, neuroanatomy. Uh, so from my perspective, it's mandatory to have uh, anatomical knowledge, a 3D morphological and special comprehension of the brain structures, uh, uh, and then develop skills and techniques that will help us to make our surgery safe, safer, achieving the maximum resection without adding morbidity to the patients. With no further comments, I want to introduce Professor Hinoshita. You introduce, okay? Uh, to speak about uh, cerebral anatomy aiming glioma surgery. Thank you, Dr. Kinoshita. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, wonderful webinar. Uh, actually, this is my first time participating in this uh, great educational platform, and I'm very, very honored to have an uh, opportunity to present uh, some of the knowledge that I learned in the last 20 years of uh, being a neurosurgeon. And um, I will start uh, sharing my slides. Can you all see yes, my slides? Yes, we can see. Okay. Um, the, um, the work that I'm going to show today is inspired from uh, Dr. Rivas from Sao Paulo. Uh, I had a chance to um, watch, uh, observe some of his uh, webinars and um, it taught me a lot. It, he taught me a lot of things that I didn't know. I personally don't know Dr. Ribas, but um, his his lecture was one of the um, uh, the motivations that, that that I have for for giving this this lecture today. Uh, as in the introduction, we have to know uh, glioma, uh, well, cerebral anatomy to to perform a good glioma surgery. And to do that, we have to understand the anatomy and the shapes and configuration of the uh, gyri and south sides. And before we go into individual cases, this is the standardized uh, MR image of 152 normal people. This was um, developed in Montreal Neurological Institute, known as the MNI-152. It's an averaged a morphological shape of the human brain of 152 uh, Caucasian uh, people. So this shape, this configuration of Sarsai and Jaira is the starting point to understand what the human brain looks like and how to understand the uh, anatomy. Because there are a lot of variations, individual vari variations, but we first, we, we have to know the basic shape and, and, and then apply those knowledge into individual patients. Um, notably, you have a very uh, large and long uh, sulcus, which is of course known as the Sylvian fissure. And then another uh, important fissure will be the pre-central sulcus. We have the central sulcus here. Um, one thing that we have to know is that the presensual sulcus, although it is named as the presensual sulcus, it is an anatomical concept. It is not the name of the sulcus itself. As you can see, in most patients, the presensual sulcus will be interrupted by the middle frontal gyrus. On the other hand, the central sulcus, the central sulcus will not be interrupted. This is a anatomical uh, nomenclature. So this is an anatomical name, but the presential sulcus is an anatomical concept. And uh, most medical textbooks um, describe the, the central sulcus as one of the major uh, south sides. Of course it is, but when you think about the uh, surgical uh, surgical anatomy, the presential sulcus will be more important than the surgical sulcus, and you, uh, you, you'll start to understand why. Uh, there is another uh, important sulcus, which is known as the inferior frontal sulcus. Um, Textbook-wise, the inferior uh, frontal sulcus will, will look like this. It will divide the middle frontal gyrus and the inferior frontal gyrus, and then it will go around the frontal operculum. But 
again, if you think about the surgery, the conceptual inferior frontal sulcus will uh, be more more convenient if you extend the line into the uh, uh, into the middle so that you you can have a clear understanding of the shape of the inferior frontal just itself rather than uh, lining up the inferior frontal sulcus right here. One of the most important landmarks, why it's most important, because there is very few variation between patients uh, and, and, and individual people. So the meeting point of the presential sulcus, the presential sulcus and the inferior frontal sulcus is one of the key landmarks. Uh, another uh, concept is the superior frontal sulcus. The superior frontal sulcus is again a anatomical concept because, as you can see here, it's divided uh, by the middle frontal gyrus and the superior frontal gyrus. And here there is a uh, another key landmark: the preessential sulcus and the superior frontal sulcus meeting point. These two uh, sul sulcus meeting points are very deep and very consistent. So that these key, these two uh, locations will be your uh, uh, your origin origin of access when you start uh, removing tumors around these areas. So this is a picture taken from Dr. Rebus's uh, famous paper in uh, uh, neurosurgical focus, and you have the Suvian fissure right over here, and you have the presential sulcus right over here. It is very interesting to note that the Suvian fissure will bend at this uh, proximal Suvian point. This we all know. So you have the proximal Suvian fissure and the distal Suvian fissure. Th this is very common knowledge. But if you extend this line, the, pres uh, the proximal Suvian fissure along into the, uh, in, in, into the uh, midline, this line will uh, approximately line up with the pre-central sulcus. So if you make a craniotomy right over here, and if you have a vein that lines that runs over the pre-central sulcus, it, it looks as if the the uh, proximal cervian fissure is is extending into the pre-central sulcus. Um, the central sulcus will run from midline to here, and you have the subcentral gyrus right here, subcentral gyrus. The subcentral gyrus sometimes cannot be seen if the cervian fissure is wide and the arachnoid is very thick. But uh, if you peel the arachnoid, you will see the subcentral gyrus connecting the precentral gyrus and the postcentral post gyrus over here. You will have another uh, U-shape here, the pars opericularis. Um, the pars opericularis is half embedded into the presential gyrus, and the presential sulcus will be uh, will be extending into the uh, pars opericularis. Before that, you will have the pars triangularis. The pars triangularis will, will have a unique triangular shape with a sulcus uh, extending into the gyrus. And before that, of course, you will have the uh, pars orbitalis. These, these three components are classically the, the three key components of the inferior frontal uh, operculum. Um, that, was, that was seen from the brain surface, but if you, uh, is, it, what, is it possible to see it from uh, outside? And, Actually, it, it, most of the thing can be identified from the skin, which is very interesting. So um, first of all, uh, I'm sorry. First of all, you have the um, ex uh, external auditory canal over here, right? And you will have a ear. And the posterior line of the ear, if you extend the posterior line of the ear into midline, that will be the starting point of the central sulcus. And as uh, Dr. Rivas always emphasized, if you extend uh, four to five centimeter above from the root of zygoma, that will be the end of the central sulcus meeting into the cervian fissure. So if you look at patient's head, you find the ear and, and you have the posterior ear line and you extend it into the midline, you will know that the central sulcus will start here. And you know that the central sulcus will end here. So then you can map the central sulcus 
on the on the skull on the skull or on the on the scalp. Another important uh, landmark is the Stephanion. The Stephanion is the meeting point of the coronal suture and the temporal line. And this point will be will approximately be the uh, point where the inferior frontal sulcus and the paracentral sulcus meets. So if you find the Stephanion, and the Stephanion is again, I I tell you, it's the meeting point of the coronal suture and the temporal uh, and the temporal line. The coronal suture and the temporal line. So you don't have the temporal muscle over here. So it is very easy to identify and palpate the Stephanion outside from the skin. So if you do that, you find the Stephanion, you and you know the central sulcus. Um, then you will have a clear uh, image of what the inferior frontal operculum will look like uh, look like from the skin. Uh, there are other interesting things to know. Uh, for example, if you want to put a, a MEP, a motor evoked uh, potential uh, stimulator, you have you want to put it in the hand area. Then what you have to do is you you find the central sulcus, uh, you find the temporal uh, temporal line, and, and the hand motor area will be just above the temporal line, just, just anterior to the central sulcus. So it will be around here. So of course you can measure measure up and identify where you can put the electrodes, but uh, you don't even have to do that. If you have these very simple knowledge, you can uh, map where the motor area is uh, from the scalp and from the skull. Uh, again, this is uh, another uh, uh, specimen. So you have the uh, Stephanion here. The highest part of the squamosal suture will be the meeting point of the central sulcus and the Suvian fissure. And as I said, if you know the uh, ear, the external ear canal, and you have the ear and you extend that into midline, you know the central sulcus. Uh, one gyrus anterior will be the precentral sulcus. You have the coronal suture, you have the Stephanion, and then you will know what where the uh, inferior frontal uh, gyrus component will be. Okay. Again, Stephanion. Stephanion is right above the meeting point of the precentral sarcus and the inferior uh, frontal sarcus. Okay. This is consistent. Of course, if you have a tumor, that will shift a little bit, but it will not shift so much. Okay, so then uh, let's go to a practical case. Um, this is a case of a uh, IDH wild type glioma. Now I think we must call it molecular GBM according to the WHO 2021 uh, classification. But in, anyways, uh, we're not going into that today. Uh, this is a uh, tumor here, okay? And if you wanna take out this tumor, uh, you have to know this is a pars triangularis tumor. You will be able to know that just by looking into the actual image. Uh, I, I, I will explain it afterwards. But anyway, this is a pars triangularis tumor. So you want to take out the pars triangularis, okay? If you want to take out the pars triangularis, how are you going to identify that? How are you going to identify that on the scalp? Again, uh, very simple. Uh, you have the ear here, you extend it uh, into the midline, and you have a 4.5 centimeter uh, point from the uh, root of zygoma. This is the end of the central sulcus. So central sulcus will run like this. One gyrus anteriorly, you will have the precentral sulcus. You know the temporal line. You find the, uh, you palpate and find the Stephanion. The Stephanion is right over here. So you know that the inferior frontal sulcus and the precentral sulcus will meet here. Then you will you will get an idea that the uh, pars operocularis will be around here. Then one gyrus anteriorly will be the pars triangularis. So you can know that the tumor will be around here, approximately, of course, but around here just by looking at the shape of the uh, patient's head. Of course, you can use navigation and ultrasound afterwards, but uh, I try to teach my residents to, to draw this picture before uh, registering the navigation system. Uh, because navigation system, if you rely on that, it's a very, uh, it's a wonderful tool, but if you rely too much on it, 
you will start to forget these very basic ideas and important landmarks. Okay, the, the scalp is reflected. You have the temporal muscle over here, and this is the temporal line. Okay, and this is the Stephanion. So now you have the Stephanion. You know that the inferior frontal sulcus and the precentral sulcus is right beneath here. Um, you have the highest point of the scamosal suture, so you know that the central sulcus will stop here. You reflect the dura. Then again, you have the sylvian fissure. This patient didn't have a developed sylvian fissure, so it's a little bit uh, difficult to identify, but you have the proximal sylvian point and the distal sylvian point. The proximal sylvian point and the precentral sulcus will be lining up like this. This is the central sulcus. You will have a boot like a a foot-like shape over here. This will be the central lobule, the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. It will look like a foot. Okay. So uh, the tumor will be here. So you, you just have to do is you coagulate the pia and you and you take out the pars triangularis. Again, if you take out the pars triangularis, then you will have the uh, surface of the intracortex beneath it. And you will see the MCA bifurcation. Uh, I take it outside Pioli, so you will be able to see the MCA and the intracerebrian component uh, beyond the arachnoid matter. But then you, you will be able to identify all the uh, insular structure or, or if you take out the pars triangularis. Opericulum is called opericulum because it is covering the insula. So the pars triangularis the pars triangularis will be covering the, the lateral and a little bit of the anterior part of the insular cortex. The pars orbitalis will be covering the anterior part of the uh, insular cortex. Uh, another thing to know that if you look at the lateral horn, uh, the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, the lateral horn of the anterior ventricle will be the landmark for you to identify the pars triangularis. The pars triangularis will be lateral to the anterior horn. If you have a pars opericularis tumor, it will be much closer to the foramen of Monroe. It will be around here, okay? If it's anteriorly to the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, it will be the pars orbitalis. So this tumor, this tumor was definitely the main lesion will definitely be the uh, pars triangularis because if you look into the relationship according to the anterior horn of the uh, lateral ventricle, it's right, uh, right at the same level. So it's a pars triangularis tumor. Okay, this is the uh, wide up view of the uh, post-operative view. So you see the MCA trunk and the insular cortex underneath it. Uh, this is the proximal sylvian point. This is the distal sylvian fissure and the anterior uh, precentral sulcus will be lining up like this and this is the central sulcus. Okay. How about this one? Th this patient has a tumor over here. This is again an IDH wild type. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the pre this is saying that the precentral gyrus is the main lesion. Um, so um, the precentral gyrus is the main lesion. Why? Uh, again, as I told you, when you Look at the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. It's mostly behind the anterior horn, more closely, uh, more, uh, much closer to the foramen of Monroe. So, and the, and the level is a little bit high. So, this tumor is uh, starting from the pars opericularis, extending upwards to the presenteral gyrus. How do you take out this tumor? Um, this was uh, right-sided, but um, she had speech difficulty. Uh, her chief of complaint was ep ep epilepsy uh, with uh, arrest of uh, sp having speech arrest. So I did her awake. But anyway, so anatomically, you have the ear, the back of the ear over here. You extend it into midline. Okay, so this is the start of the central sulcus. You palpate the uh, root of zygoma four, five centimeter upwards at the end of the central sulcus. So you have a clear picture that the central sulcus will be will be running like this. So the precentral sulcus is here. So the anterior, uh, uh, the precentral gyrus will be here. 
and the subcentral gyrus will be here. So you, then you know that the tumor is over here. So you don't need a navigation. You, if you know this much, you can design the skin incision and, and the bone flap according to this knowledge. Uh, let's look at the intraoperative pictures. So the, the lesion is mostly presential gyrus. So if you open up the dura, this is the distal cerevian fissure. You have a boot-like structure over here. So this is the central lobule, uh, pre and post central gyrus. And you have the central sulcus over here. Uh, one sulcus anterior is the pre-central sulcus. You have the inferior frontal sulcus. The meeting point is right over here. You can confirm it if you look at the bone flap that will be right beneath the Stephanion. So the tumor, the tumor will be over here. Um, the tumor itself was extending a little bit to the uh, post, post central gyrus as, along the uh, sub central gyrus. So my goal was to take out this orange part of this patient. And what I did was I did that. So uh, if you start to resect the, the brain tissue below, below the superior uh, superior marginal sarcus, then you will start to see the insular sarcus, the insular surface. So this is the superior margin of the, uh, of the insula. The patient was done awake and she didn't have any speech difficulty during surgery. So I was able to remove about 85% of this tumor. 50% uh, was left behind because she started to, have, uh, to, to experience speech difficulties. But anyways, um, this will be the final product of, of the uh, uh, the surgery. Um, the brain the brain is slack now because of the CSS drainage. You can see the proximal cerebrum fissure, the distal cerebrum fissure, and this will be the remnant of the precentral sulcus. Okay. How do you take out a uh, lesion like this? I know there are multiple ways to do this. Um, some surgeon might prefer to make a bicoronal frontal craniotomy and come from front. That is one way to do. Um, I do it from lateral um, because I don't want to go too deep into this structure. If you go from the front, um, you will have a very nice view of the, in, of the medial part of the tumor, of course. But the difficulty is that you might violate and go into the basal ganglia and, and disrupt some of, some of the uh, perforators at the depths of the tumor. Um, to avoid that, I prefer to go from lateral because if you make a lot, if you define the posterior part, uh, posterior margin of the resection from lateral, you will not uh, there is a little chance where there are fewer fewer chance of going more more into the uh, depths of the brain. So I go from lateral. Uh, the disadvantage of going from lateral is that you will, you will have um, some difficulty uh, uh, to remove the medial part of the tumor. That will that will become difficult. So if you go from anterior, this part will be difficult. If you go from lateral, this part will be difficult. Anyway, there is no very there is no easy way to do it, but. I prefer to go from lateral. So again, um, I put the patient uh, head in lateral position, uh, ear, central sulcus, pre-central sulcus, uh, Stephanion, uh, inferior frontal sulcus, and you make a craniotomy. This tumor is mostly uh, located in the pars orbitalis. So you have to take out the pars orbitalis. Okay. Uh, the patient is positioned like this. You can put the patient in lateral position or in spine lateral position. Um, that will depend on the age and, and the shape and, and the shape of the body of the patient. Um, this patient was done in a spine lateral, but but the head was it was completely lateral. Um, I think many of you know the, Professor Dufour in Montpellier. He always used lateral, lateral position, and and I try to stick on that. I have only two positions for uh, glioma surgery: a left or a right lateral position, and that is it. I always keep the anatomical uh, relationship the same whenever the wherever the tumor is. So this is the. Um, 
the picture right after uh, dual opening. So you have the proximal cerebrian uh, fissure, and this you have the distal cerebrian fissure. The angle of the fissure changed radically right over here. So that means that you have the pars triangularis right over here. The pre-central sulcus will be here. So uh, again, like I said, if you extend the proximal cerebrian fissure right upwards, it will continue to the pre-central sulcus. It will look like it's continuing to the pre-central sulcus, okay? You have the pars triangularis here, the pars is here. So the tumor will be pars orbitalis, so the tumor is right over here. Uh, this will be the surgical, surgical, surgical concept of the inferior frontal sarcus. The textbook wise inferior frontal sarcus will, will, will look like this. We, we should run like this, but the surgical uh, concept of the inferior frontal sarcus will look like this, going into midline. So um, I took out the tumor. So the ba frontal base will be here. Okay, the frontal base will be here. And the pars triangularis, you can identify it much easier after surgery because the brain is relaxed and you can identify more uh, sulcus, more south sides. So the sulcus is extending into the gyrus here. So this is definitely the pars triangularis. And the or orbitalis is, is removed, like here, okay? This part, okay, this part is left behind uh, because I didn't have to take it for take it out for this patient. But um, you will have to correlate the post-operative image with the intra uh, in intersurgical photographs. So this part corresponds to this part on the MR image. MR images in actual is cut in an OM line, right? So the um, O, 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 orbital and e, 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 exter, e, external ear canal line. So the MR image is is cut in an, in the axle like like in this uh, orientation. So the base of the front uh, the frontal base will line up along to the actual plane of the MR image. So if you have a if you have a lesion or tissue left over here, that will, mean, uh, that will mean that the tissue is corresponding, the leftover tissue is corresponding to the anterior part of the cerebrum fissure. So it's definitely this part. So you will have to always correlate which part corresponds to which part uh, to, to learn, to, to, to train yourself. This becomes very important if you want to take out low-grade gliomas. Uh, this patient came to me uh, with an extensive uh, inter uh, extensive uh, increase of the intracranial pressure, so the the lesion is most mostly pars orbitalis, but uh, but it's on the left side, and she had a, um, a, a very severe headache. So, of course, if you want to take out a low-grade glioma on the left side, you want to do awake surgery, but I thought it would be too risky to do an awake surgery at the first session, because if you do an awake surgery, the brain will, will have volume because you are going to awake the patient during surgery. So the first session of the surgery, the, the aim of the first session of the surgery was to debulk the tumor as much as I can so that I can put this patient to the second session for awake surgery. So this is the picture of the first surgery, okay? So this is the frontal base. This is the cerebrum fissure. Um, the brain is very tight, so you cannot see the distal cerebrum fissure after dural opening. But you can see the uh, textbook-wise inferior frontal sarcus over here. You have the pars triangularis or orbit orbitalis. But the surgical inferior frontal sarcus will look like this, extending into midline. The tumor will be uh, mostly occupying this whole area, but because it is on the left side, the, for the first session of the surgery, I didn't go much deep into the uh, posterior in, posterior to the uh, pars triangularis. I just re removed the pars orbitalis part like this. You can see the um, 
the fox, the initial, uh, the start of the fox in the, in the depth, so that so that the fox of the depth, the depth of the fox will be the landmark of the midline of this resection. This is the picture after the first session of the surgery. You can see the inferior frontal sarcus. The brain is now relaxed, so you can see the proximal and distal cerebellum fissure. The extension line of the proximal cerebellum fissure will go up like this. So this is the presential sarcus. This is the presential sarcus and the inferior frontal sarcus meeting point. And this is the relaxed uh, pars triangularis. So let's see how this was done. So this is the post-operative image after first uh, first session of the surgery. So you have the tissue left over here. So the leftover tumor will be right beneath this tissue, right over here, which means surgically. So in the surgical field, the leftover tissue is right over here. So the tumor is beneath here anterior to the uh, 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 pars triangularis, okay? So the aim of the second surgery will be to remove this part and go deep to take out all the, all the remnant. So this is the post-surgical uh, view and the MRI of, of the surgery. So I took out the whole pars orbitalis and uh, came close to pars triangularis. Uh, this patient started to started to experience a little bit of a difficulty of speech, so um, I left the pars triangularis intact. But as you can see, this part of the tissue was removed, and you will have a really relatively nice resection of the tumor. So the initial volume was 122 milliliters and post-surgically it was 11 milliliters. So the uh, surgical resection rate was about 91%. Interestingly, interestingly for this patient, the cognitive function will, was uh, increased after surgery uh, significantly, like the verbal memory was incre increased from 67 to 99. So um, you can achieve a in, uh, increase of cognitive function while you, although you are removing the left frontal lobe. Very interesting for low Gregory on patients. Um, this is a one of the summarized uh, picture uh, of how to understand the brain and the anatomy from the lateral side of the brain. Um, again, you have the proximal cerebellum fissure and the distal cerebellum fissure. The angle will change at the pars triangularis. If you extend the proximal cerebellum fissure along to midline, that will correspond to the line of the precentral sulcus. You will have a, pre a central sulcus right behind. And the inferior frontal sulcus, the surgical or the textbook in inferior frontal sulcus will meet to the precentral sulcus at the uh, at beneath is Stefanion. The lateral, uh, the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle will be uh, located beneath the pars triangularis, the posterior part of the pars triangularis. Okay, the foramen of Monroe will locate um, around the central sulcus, so uh, uh, just anterior to the central sulcus and a little bit above the cerebellum fissure. So, if you make a craniotomy and find these landmarks, you will be able to see uh, pretty much where the lateral ventricle will be. And because the um, corticospinal tract will run behind the foramen of Monroe, you will know that the corticospinal tract will run like this. So you might not have the depths information of the depths, but you will have the information uh, from anterior to posterior, uh, not only for, uh, of the structure surface of the brain, but the structure deep into the brain. Okay. Another line that I like to use is the bisecting line of the pars triangularis. If you extend a line, you make a line of the bisecting line of the pars triangularis. The extension of the line will be the starting point of the temporal horn. So if you see the mid temporal gyrus, the temporal horn will be embedded 
beneath the the temporal horn will be embedded beneath the uh, middle temporal gyrus, but the starting point of the temporal horn will be just behind the bisecting line of the pars triangularis. So if you want to go into the temporal horn, you won't be able to find the, uh, the temporal horn while you are digging into the temporal uh, lobe over here. You have to go a little bit more behind. So for beginners, I always suggest them to, to make a craniotomy, to extend the craniotomy into the frontal side, even if you are working in the temporal lobe tumor, so that you can find the pars triangularis, and then you will have a you, you can make this bisecting line so that you can have a clear picture of the where the temporal horn will start. Okay. If you want to go into the frontal horn, you, you just have to make a hole into the posterior part of the pars triangularis. Again, when you look at the MR images, if the lesion is located lateral to the anterior horn, that will be pars triangularis. You will have to have this uh, correl each correlation of the uh, locations according to the surface of the brain and the uh, uh, structure of the uh, ventricles. See, so again, if you if you get to know those ideas and those concepts, you can clearly see that this lesion is definitely a lesion of the pars triangularis. Okay, we have a little bit more time, so let's go to the um, posterior part of the brain. So the posterior part of the brain, you will have the distal cerebrum fissure, which the distal cerebrum fissure will extend two realms, the ascending and descending realms. So the cerebrum fissure will uh, be divided by these two realms. Okay? And you will have the superior, superior temporal sulcus. The superior temporal sulcus will start from, from the temporal lobe but actually it extends into the parietal lobe. So the end of the superior temporal, uh, superior temporal sulcus is the parietal lobe. Another uh, important sulcus is of course the intraparietal sulcus, which divides the superior and inferior parietal lobule and the postcentral sulcus. There, the intraparietal sulcus meets into the posterior central sulcus and you will have a meeting point over here, pretty much like the meeting point of the superior frontal sulcus and the uh, precentral sulcus. Okay, so this, there, will be, there will be a meeting point. It's a very deep, deep uh, sulcus. So if you want to go into, if you want to go into the, uh, the posterior part of the lateral ventricle, like if you have a meningioma at the trigon, uh, people sometimes make a hole into the brain, uh, a high parietal approach. I think that is a reasonable approach. Or some people suggest to open the interparietal sulcus and, and find the postcentral sulcus and interparietal sulcus meeting point and cut the uh, uh, cut the fibers right beneath the sulcus so that you you minimize the cut of the brain tissue to go into the lateral ventricle, removing a meningioma. Uh, this orange part is the angular gyrus, which is uh, divided by the superior temporal sulcus. So the end of the superior temporal sulcus is the angular gyrus. And the end of the superior arms of the uh, cerebrum fissure is the supramarginal gyrus. Okay. So you have the intraparietal sulcus and you have the superior uh, uh, temporal sulcus. It look, which goes into the parietal lobe, and you have the angular and the superior marginal gyrus. Another specimen, um, just to orient you, you have the ear here. This is anterior, this is posterior. Uh, the eye will be over here, just to orient you, okay? You have the cerebrum fissure. This is the central sulcus. You have the cerebrum fissure. Cerebrum fissure will extend around superiorly. So this part is a marginal gyrus. The superior temporal gyrus goes into the parietal lobule and ends at the angular gyrus. You have the intraparietal sulcus. Look at how the intraparietal sulcus is deep. You have the posterior central sulcus. This is the meeting point. And then you will have a clear picture of the angular and the superior marginal gyrus. 
uh, let's apply this knowledge to this uh, patient. This is a IDH mutant uh, anaplastic gastrocytoma, uh, right side. This tumor is located at the supramarginal gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. This you have a you see a sulcus over here in the actual image. So this is the postcentral sulcus dividing the tumor. So again, ear, you start the ear, you look at the midline, you run, you write the central, uh, central sulcus, and you then you write the post central sulcus. So then you get the idea of where the tumor is. Okay. I flipped the MR image to, or, to make the orientation easier. So this is the right side, uh, parietal craniotomy. This is anterior, this is posterior, this is superior, and this is inferior. Looking at the MR image, you have the posterior cerebellum fissure. Um, this is a central lobule. This is the superior arms. This is upside down. So this is the superior arms of the distal cerebellum fissure. So this tumor is definitely the, uh, located at the marginal gyrus, the anterior part of the marginal gyrus, and extending into the postcentral gyrus. The blue line here is the postcentral sulcus. If you look at the surgical picture, you have the extension of this distal cerebellum fissure, superior arms. So this whole part is the supra, supramarginal gyrus and the tumor is divided by the postcentral sulcus. So the tumor is, well, this A, B, is, is this, this um, alphabetical level is the location of the tumor. Number one, this was done in a week again. Uh, when I sp stimulated this area, the patient uh, had a speech arrest. So that is, this is a negative motor uh, mapping, negative motor area, which is the precentral gyrus. So definitely this is, the presenteral gyrus. This is the presenteral sarcus. This is anatomically and functionally verified during surgery. So um, what you have to do is you have to resect the supramarginal gyrus and the presenteral gyrus. This will be the postcentral sarcus. Again, this is the picture removed uh, with the tumor removed. Um, this is a remnant of the distal cerebellum fissure. Um, of course, the, the tumor is, is resected, so you don't have the postcentral sarcus anymore because it, the whole thing is, is resected, but the hypothetical postcentral sarcus should have been here. Um, one note, okay? One thing I should note you. The tumor was well, nearly completely resected, maybe like 95% resection. The supramarginal gyrus and the postcentral gyrus is resected, as you can see. One thing that we have to be very careful about removing postcentral gyrus tumor is that um, occasionally you will have ischemic events at the depths of resection, and uh, you will not be able to avoid this ischemic lesion because you will be removing the brain tissue that is supplying the uh, white uh, matter uh, fiber tracts uh, over here because you are removing the whole vascular and uh, and um, uh, parenchymal structures or lateral to, to the depths of the brain. So you will not be able to you will always have is ischemic events if you take out the lateral part of brain surfaces. But um, if you can do awake surgery, please be careful to remove the anterior part of the posterior central gyrus. The anterior part of the posterior central gyrus uh, during surgery that will be here. Anterior part of the post post central gyrus will be the uh, will be uh, covering the uh, corticospinal tract so if you make a very severe ischemic lesion at the anterior part of the postcentral gyrus the patient will have a unrecoverable uh, hemiparesia so uh, during awake surgery what i always do is i switch my task for the patient 
for a more uh, detailed, uh, detailed and, and precise movement like a, a finger movement to catch any abnormalities during uh, tumor resection so that if, if the patient experiences any kind of a slight difficulty in her uh, finger movements, um, that will be a sign, a indication to stop the surgery uh, right there so that you will not extend the ex is ischemic lesion more anteriorly. So please, please be very careful when you go into the anterior part uh, of the post central gyrus, okay? Uh, again, this will be another case, a uh, similar case of the uh, um, uh, marginal gyrus and temporal gyrus tumor. Uh, so this is a craniotomy. So this is a distal picture, a superior uh, marginal gyrus, and you have the inferior uh, marginal gyrus, and you have the superior temporal gyrus. The trigon M3 point will be right uh, beneath the superior marginal gyrus and the temporal, uh, temporal horn. So um, if you take out the tumor, the, uh, the uh, temporal horn will be, uh, the trigon will be right beneath the tumor, okay? So to summarize, this will be my final slide. So please remember, memorize these whole configurations of the lateral surface of the brain so that you can see through all the uh, structures uh, beneath your surgical field. So thank you very much. Uh, congratulations for your presentation, Dr. Kinoshito. Uh, I, uh, I use the, I apply the neuronatal in all my surgeries. I have a big lab in Sao Paulo. I give two or three courses about suicide gyros and ventricles a year. And uh, uh, I worked with Dr. Evandro de Oliveira for 16 years. And I, all my surgeries, I apply neuronarily. And I help Dr. Ribas in a lot of surgeries. Uh, I will speak about you for, for him today. Oh, uh, please. Uh, a great uh, honor. <laughs> it's a very friendly. Uh, I usually, uh, in insula gliomas, uh, I, use the, I use the relationship of the middle cerebral artery as an anatomical mark. Uh, the pars triangular is pointed to the limit uh, of the insula, which marks the transition of the M1 and to M2. Uh, this uh, change from M1 to M2 is a major marker of the limit insula. Do you use vascular marker in your surgeries? Yes, of course I do. Um, I I didn't have much time to go into the insula because today I wanted to focus more on the basic basic knowledge of the anatomy. But um, as you can, uh, as you said, the M1, M2 is the Lehman insula. But that means that the uh, if you make a subpyar dissection, subpyar dis dissection of the inferior frontal uh, lobule or the superior temporal lobule you will be able to identify the MCA um, uh, from a, a sub, uh, uh, not from, I, I don't go into the sub arachnoid space. I always go uh, from outside of the sub arachnoid space, but I can see these, these, these MCA structures within the uh, sub arachnoid space. So you can, you can identify the limit of the insula. Uh, another landmark that I use for insular surgery is that if it's extending into the temporal lobe, I often open the temporal horn because that will be the the very inferior part of the insular. Yeah. If you if this tumor is extending into the frontal part, I use the superior. Of course, I use the superior frontal, uh, superior marginal sulcus, because that will be the uh, superior limiting. Um, uh, I uh, superior limit. Uh, landmark for the insula. The problem is always the depths. The depths is difficult, but um, I find the depths of the insula by locating the superior and the inferior uh, marginal sulcus. If you if you can make a connecting line within the surgical field, that will pretty much be the the depths of the insula. So I I try to make a cut. Uh, locating two, 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 uh, two marginal sulcuses, the superior and the inferior. 
I know that, uh, like Professor Dufo tried to identify that um, functionally, uh, looking into the IFOF, but um, that is very difficult to to reproduce, um, at, at least from my experience. Yeah, I, I believe that neural narrative is essential to performing a great surgery. Uh, in your surgeries, even in the minimal approaches, do you also think it's essential to expose the anatomical markers? Or do you fully uh, really own technology? I use both. I well, it's interesting because I used to rely yeah. a lot, a lot on technology. I love navigation and and I love technology. But as you start to learn and evolve yourself, then you can let go of technology. You can use technology, but you become more unreliant on technology and you get more and you rely more on anatomical knowledge and and that makes surgery much safer interestingly at least for my yeah. case <laughs> uh, so i have one two more questions sir uh, in your wake surgery how do you access and determine when to stop the resection which tools, tools do you use? That is very difficult. It's more uh, like an art to, to identify when to stop. And that, that depends on which function you are focusing on. For example, if you're focusing on motor functions, the, the, the initial part of the surgery, I ask the patient to make a very um, large movement so that you know that you're not doing something very wrong. But like in the parietal part of the case that I showed you in the last, I, I start, I ask the patient to, to, to count by their fingers because I want to know a very precise disturbance uh, of their motor weaknesses so that I can stop. For languages, for languages, um, I use a symptom like um, uh, perseveration. Perseveration, Barbara perseveration is a very good indicator for me to stop the surgery. First of all, if the patient starts to perseverate, you will not be able to monitor the patient anymore. So it's not safe to continue the surgery. That's uh, reason number one. Reason number two is that the patient is if the patient is uh, is presenting passive duration, mostly the, the the symptom will recover after rehabilitation, about three weeks or so. It will not take that long. So the so passive duration is a disturbance, uh, disturbance, disturbance that will recover after surgery, after surgery, you, that will be sure. And in that case, it, when it recovers, the function of the language will be reorganized mostly in those patients after rehabilitation. That means that you will have another chance to resect more because the language structure will be different in, six, in the second surgery. So I, when the patient starts to perseverate, I stop the surgery at that time, but that doesn't mean that I won't, that doesn't mean that I won't perform pa uh, surgery for that patient anymore. That means that I will have another chance to do the do an operation on him or her after she recovers. Okay. And how do you visualize the glioma surgery in the next 20 years? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> how, 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 that's very difficult. Um, very difficult. We, we, we don't even know where the tumor is on MRI, like, right? right? Um, yeah. it, it looks like that. For example, if you have a low-grade glioma, you have a T2 flare, high high lesion like that, and you thought that you did only a partial removal, but if you look at an MR image, like like two months afterwards, the the T2 high is shrinking in some patients. So that means that that part was not a tumor; that was just an edema. And in some patients, that the, the T2 flare high will remain as it is. So it's not an edema, it's the tumor itself. We don't even can't, we don't even can't uh, identify which, which, where the tumor really is. So <laughs> that's a really tough question. And for finish, uh, what do you think about the use, the five yala or fluorescein in high grade glioma surgery? Ah. Uh, that, that is very um, helpful. That is very helpful, especially for non-enhancing non high-grade gliomas. 
because for for enhancing lesions you know whether you will be able to remove it or you won't be able to remove it before surgery right you know that but for non-enhancing tumors um, that helps you to identify which part has more tumor which which tissue contains more tumor um, which we cannot uh, which information we cannot retrieve just looking at MRIs. So, of course, I, I routinely use 5LA for, for uh, high-grade gliomas. Congratulations for your presentation. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, Haj, thank you for the thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you very much for this wonderful session, and we learned a lot. Today we are... Uh, uh, joined by our Honorable Vice President of ACNS, Professor Shubin, and we're extremely grateful that he could join us despite his busy schedule. I would like to invite him to deliver his uh, uh, New Year message to us, Professor Shubin. Thank you, Raja, and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Kenoshita. And uh, today is a very special day in China, and. Uh, is the last day of the year of tiger uh, in the China's lunar calendar. And uh, now it's uh, celebrated all over the China. And uh, tomorrow is the first day of the year of rabbit. So thanks to all the staffs of ACNS, especially Raja, and the experts and the colleagues who took an active part in the uh, webinars and uh, uh, last, uh, last year, we uh, very successfully held the ACNS con uh, Congress and uh, with more than uh, 12, uh, 120,000 participants. And uh, during the uh, regular uh, ACNS webinars, uh, uh, which was uh, organized by Raja and uh, Dr. Liu, and there, uh, there were more than uh, 200,000 uh, participants. And uh, I believe uh, in the rabbit uh, year, we can achieve more uh, even. Thank you. And uh, also thank you to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Gu Wentao, uh, because this is uh, uh, in this very special day, uh, he's there uh, take part in this webinar. Thank you, Raja. Well, thank you very much, Professor Shubin. This wouldn't have been possible without your wonderful support. And we are extremely grateful to you for being there with us all through the last two years. So thank you very much, uh, both Professor Kinoshita and Professor Reshadat for this wonderful first session. Now we'll move on to the second session and uh, we'll straight away hear the wonderful lecture from Professor Gu Wentao. Professor Wentao. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and happy Chinese New Year. Just as uh, Professor Shi has mentioned, we are celebrating the New Year of, uh, in Chinese rural year also, sorry. And I'm Dr. Wen Tao Gu from the Department of Neurosurgery, Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. And uh, it is my honor to be here to give a lecture about microsurgical treatment of spinal hemangiomas tumors. And uh, this is uh, today's uh, outline of my talk. And as we all know, hemangiomas tumors are benign, slow, slow growing vascular tumors that can occur throughout the neural axis. And these are his histopathological benign with low oncological mortalities, which are classified as WHO grade one. And uh, CNS hemangiobastoma uh, mainly located in the posterior cranial fossa, which accounting for about 90%, while spinal hemangiobastoma accounting about only about 2% to 15% of all uh, spinal tumors, including the intramedullary tumors and uh, also extramedullary tumors. And the incidence rate is about 0 0.015 per 100,000 persons. Besides, 30% of them are associated with hem VHL syndrome. So let's, let's take a look about uh, hemangiobrastomas and he VHL syndromes. VHL syndrome is an autosome dominant inherited genetic syndrome 
uh, caused by a germline mutation of a chromosome 3, which is a VHF gene. The VHF gene is located on the short arm of the chromosome 3 and is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, a germline mutation of VHF account for about 90% of the patients affected by VHL. Patients affected with VHL will develop multiple central nervous lesions, including the retinal and craniospinal hemoendostomus, as well as the endocrine lymphomic sac tumors. And hemoendoblastomas are the most common tumor presentation of VHL patients. Most of VHL patients will develop multiple hemoendotomas over time because hemoendotomas grow at a different rate in multiple lesions. So they exhi ex exhibit irregular growth patterns and also symptoms formation can be unpredictable. So patients with spinal hemoendotomas should be screened for other manifestations of VHL. So in our department, we have done a retrospect retrospective analysis of patients uh, from the January 2010 to December 2014. We have uh, uh, got 30 cases of spinal hematomas. Of the 60 patients, 35 were male and 25 were female. And the male to female ratio is about 1.4 uh, to 1. And the median age at diagnosis is about uh, 36.68 years old. And the main clinical symptoms include the sensor change about in 45 patients, about 75%. And the secondary is the pain in about 37 patients. And then the motor deficit about uh, 16 patients. And then the blood and bone dysfunction in about eight patients. Clinical progression is, was relatively low and the mean duration of symptom was about 22.3 months. A total of 19 patients met the criteria of VHL syndrome. Uh, among them, we have eight patients with multiple CNS hemoangioblastomas, and four with a family history of VHL, and four with pancreas cysts, and two with multiple kidney cysts, and one with retinal hemoangioblastomas. Uh, we use McCormick grade scale to assess the neurologic status of the patients. This is the preoperative McCormick score. Uh, we can see there are 14 patients was uh, classified as grade one before the operation and 30 of them were classified as grade two. And 14 patients was grade three and just two patients of them were grade two. A preoperative MI scan is the fundamental of the uh, this diagnosis to correctly plan the surgical approach to the lesion. And we uh, commonly use T1 and T1 enhancement and also T2 weighted MI sequence to pinpoint the precise location of the tumor on the axial plane and uh, the extension in the sagittal plane. Radiographically, we can classify them as three types. The first type and also the most common type is the syndrome type, which is the tumor with syringe myelia. Uh, they cost, uh, account about 80% of all the spinal hemangioblast tumors. And then about the cyst type, just as the tumors in the uh, posterior cranial fossa small nodule and with a big cyst, which account only about 8%. Then about the, the third type is the solid pie type, tumor with no obvious cyst or cynix. Uh, from the radiographically, we can see the tumor location. Uh, according to the spinal vertebra, we can see 
27, of, uh, 27 patients were located in the cervical spine and uh, 23 located in the thoracic and uh, 10 patients located in the lumbar spine. Most tumors and were dorsally, about 95%. Then uh, the vascularization may be assessed with the MRIA or a preoperative DSA is not routinely carried out and may be performed to, uh, to catalyze the vascularization about enlarged feeding arteries and also the drainage vein. Uh, because the feeding arteries uh, of the spinal hematoangioplastomas can be easily identified intraoperatively for most tumors. And the spinal DSA was performed only in patients with large tumors or with tumors that involving the medulla ablavenda. This is our department uh, opinion. And then we can see the management. The management is commonly, uh, the first course is the microsurgery. And then some people may use some um, embolization and also radiotherapy. So let's see the uh, preoperative embolization remains controversial because of the embolization of feeding arteries can reduce the blood supply of the uh, tumor and improve the view of the surgical field by decreasing the size of the lesion through necrosis and shrinkage. But however, uh, different from embolization of the cranial hematoblastomas, this procedure in requires complicated superselective catheterization and we rarely use them. Moreover, some complications has been reported, such as intracranial hemorrhage, exacerbation of hydrocephalus, and the deterioration of neurological functions. There is still no evidence clearly demonstrating the advantage of preoperative embolization in terms of quality of tumor removal. So we just uh, re recommended the, the use of embolization in, uh, uh, in, in some in selective cases. So then the microsurgery. The first choice, uh, complete resection is the first choice of the hemoangiotomus uh, in the spinal cord. And with the advancement in microsurgery techniques, for spinal tumors in recent years make such tumor remove much safer. And embryo resection by careful microsurgical dissection of the tumor margin from its pie attachment is advocated. So let's see the uh, microsurgical procedures. The patient is placed in the pro position by a posterior midline approach. The abdominal should be free, and thus limiting the intra-abdominal pressure and allowing a good venous drainage. Then a continuous MEP and SSEP monitoring should be routinely be performed uh, with the external place depending on the location of the lesion. So if you do the lumbar, lumbar case, you do not to need to place the external in the arms. So MEP and SEP, SSEP provide a feedback to the surgeon during spinal cord manipulation. A baseline recording in the preoperative period should be performed to have a reference during the surgical manipulation of spinal cord. So after exposure of the posterior elements, a laminectomy is performed at the proper level as the dural is exposed. 
the operating microscope is then brought into the surgical field. Uh, after open the dura, we, we do the operation on the microscope. So then the, um, the dura is opened in the midline and extended the depending on the longitudinal extension of the lesion. The arachnoid is opened respectively. After this stage, we often can see the abnormal vessels and we start dilated drainage veins along the dorsal uh, part of the spine. Then we, we performed a dorsal myelotomy in the posterior sulcus, uh, and the little uh, the micro dissector are used to deepen the surgical field and to discover the superior and inferior pole of the lesions, which should be widely exposed. The lesion is usually uh, easily identified. Now infiltration and well defined with the reddish part, and most of them have a cyst part. Then we use bipolars uh, with uh, just a very low intensities to coagulate the tumor capsule, uh, respecting the venous, just to leave them at this stage and avoid the bleeding of the venous, venous at this stage. And the same solution starts with retracted and uh, cleavage with plan between the hematoblastoma and uh, the spinal cord will be progressively identified. Once the lesion is mobilized, the feeding arteries can be easily found. And we can, uh, at this part, we can coagulate the uh, artery of the feeding artery. And tumor is resected in just one single piece. And the resection should be uh, performed in one piece because a subtotal resection always makes uh, the bleeding of the tumor. And uh, once the resection is completed, the one is exposed and complete uh, hemostasia should be attempted. There are some tips of the microsurgery about uh, the venous vein. And the drainage vein is always thin and dark, which is different from the artery, which is thick and red. But sometimes it is hard to identify the drainage vein from the uh, artery. And uh, some, some centers may use the ICG videography to guide the resection. This real-time imaging allows a direct evaluation of the extent of the exposure. And some neurosurgeons using a temporary uh, artery occlusion with clipping of the main arteries during the ICG video angiography to give a useful assessment of the main and minor feeders and help in the during the optimal. Then the, the, uh, the protocol of the resection of the two, the hematoblastoma uh, follows this one just as first, we just cutting off the feeding arteries, then the section, then cutting off the drainage vein. Uh, at last, we can go to the total removal of the hematoblastoma, which is just the same as the removal of the AVM. So then, during the operation, we must be sure to keep in mind and which is never to resect tumor before vascularity will be well reduced. And then uh, never to occlude the drainage vein before the feeding artery is su sufficiently cut off. So always veins goes the last. And the key to the surgery is to perform a complete resection with uh, preservation of normal surrounding neurosurgery, uh, neural tissues. In the 60 cases, we have gotten 59 
of them got total resection, and one got subtotal resection because of the tumor's uh, volume is very large in the cervical. So <clears throat> in evaluating the most uh, appropriate surgical approach to the tumor, the factors to consider are the location of the lesion and the presence of an associated cyst or syrinx, and also the surrounding edema and the presence of associated lesions. However, significant neurological morbidities can occur by their presence in the spinal cord for reason of location or surgical approach. Such morbidity frequently arise from associated syndromyelia with common, common clinical presentation of pain and sensory or motor disturbance. In our center, or in our series, 68.3% of patients remained neurological stable after microsurgery, and 20% of them have the improvement of the McCormick scale, and 71% uh, of them got worse. Uh, but all of them have a long, the long-term follow-up shows uh, was well. This is uh, similar to other series and suggests benefits in treating patients uh, with microsurgery is good. Uh, so, and besides, in our uh, case series, there's none of them have got preoperative embolization in the 60 cases. So, for so microsurgery was recommended to every symptomatic patient and also the non VHL patients as soon as possible. And in VHL patients, microsurgery was recommended if tumor growth was observed or MI in the next critical time. The goal was to remove the main issues for VHL patients and also the adjacent tumors if possible at, at one time. Moreover, surgery was recommended as soon as possible. If the uh, observation of the MI progress. So prior to, to the development SIS patients, uh, when the patient have got cannot undergo resection, so the, they were commonly got the conventional radiation to choose them. But uh, during the uh, during the period of the uh, prior to SRS, the conventional radiotherapy is not good with low doses. And uh, when the dose acceleration to 50 gray or more, will lead to a more encouraging results and help to re-expect the low of radiotherapy in VHL patients. In patients with disseminated cases, radiotherapy is the dominant therapy for disease control. Then uh, about the SRS. SRS has been utilized for treating of CNS hemoendoblastomas in VHL disease. And with the rapid technology development in treating planning, upgrades to treatment delivery system and advancing onboard imaging capacities and have led to the introduction of high precision of SIS alternative in select patients with spinal hemoendoblastomas who are unable to undergo resection. So spine SRS series have been very encouraging given the high rate of disease control, uh, often exceeding about 90%, improvements in disease-related neurological syndromes, and lack of significant adverse toxicities 
Also, patient selection is key to appropriate triage of patient for SRS and uh, decision with respect to radiation injury to the spinal cord associated with high dose perfection inherent to spine size. So very robust patient immobilization and accurate target volume of fertilization and the determination are criteria to planning spine SRS for patients with hemoadenoblastomas. It provides a non-invasive alternative to surgery and has been increasingly utilized in primary management of CNS hematomas. Conversely, radiation-induced myelopathy has been reported in patients undergoing SIS to the spine with potential permanent neurological deficit. So, then we can see some case, case, cases. The first case is a 30 year old female, which chief complaint is bilateral up limb numbness for three months. Uh, she came to our hospital, and we can see from the MI scan, we can see the tumor look mainly looking at the C2 to C3. And tumor with obfuse enhancement with uh, serendipity myelium. And we also perform art tests to screen for the VHL disease. And but they are also no, they are all normal. They are normal in the retinal and normal in the abdominal. So this is maybe a spor sporadic uh, spinal hemangioblastoma. During the operation, after opening of the dura, we can see the abnormal fin uh, drainage fan and also can see the tumor is located into medullary. After exposure of the tumor, we first cut off the feeding arteries, uh, then to resect the tumor. At the last, we had, we, after this is image, after resection of the hemangioblastomas. And we can see also the drainage vein may be shrinkage after resection. This is the second case. This is a 39-year-old male complaining by lateral limb numbness for one year. And uh, the tumor mainly look in the C1 and may also uh, incur the medullary blugenda. A tumor is also intramedullary. This is the image, a photo we can see during the operation, find there's an abnormal venous genetic vein, and this is a tumor, hematoblastomas. So at the first stage, we must leave the genetic vein room and to respect them, do not to cut them. Otherwise, we can, otherwise we, you will get the bleeding of the hematoblastoma, and it is very hard to remove it. So we also follow the protocol. Artery goes first, and then to dissect the tumor margin, and then to cut, cut the feeding arteries, and also the, the last we cut off the feeding, the drainage vein, and we have got total remove of the hemangioblastomas. Now there's also another case of the C1 to C2 hemangioblastomas. This is tumor located in the latter part, and some of them was extra medullary, so it is much easier than the second case. We also got a total removal of the cyst tumor. Uh, this is a case of VHL disease, and this is a 24, a 25 year old male, female, a chief complaint of bilateral upper numbness for three months. So she came to our department to seek for help. And uh, during the operate, uh, during the preoperative MI scan, we can see there are like, two lesions of hematoblastomas located in the C4 to C5, and also the C7. There so are two hematoblastomas, and we have also done the screen for the VHL disease, and we find the patient have a uh, liver and tumor. 
and others is negative. Retinol is ne negative, and uh, pancreatitis is also negative. Kidney is negative, and there's no other lesions in the uh, cranial and also other parts of the spine. So um, before the operation, we see there are two lesions in C4 and also the C7, they are too close. So we have surgical plan to remove the tumor at one, at one stage, what is one stage. Uh, during the operation, we, we resected the two tumors after the laminectomy, we exposed the both, both the C4 to C7 and then removed the two tumors. This is the image after the resection of the tumor. We have got total resection of the two tumors and the patient is very fine. So this is the fifth case. This is a, a, thoracic, a thoracic case. And this is a 60 year old female and compared to the FGLM nominees for six months, which is a T5 hemangioblastoma and located in the lateral dorsal part of the spine. We also perform microsurgery to resect the tumor totally. So as, a, as to conclusion, 30% of spinal hematoblastomas were associated with VHL disease and microsurgery was recommended to every symptomatic patient as soon as possible. And also the non and also for the non VHL disease patients. And treatment is most commonly complete microsurgical resection. And the long term treatment results were favorable for all patients. So, thank you for your attention. Yeah, today may be a little bit fast. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a very wonderful presentation, and we are extremely grateful to you for. Uh, bringing us this precise and crispy <coughs> essay about spinal hemangioblastomas. Yes, we can open our discussions. Ben is, has joined us from Hong Kong. Would you like to ask anything, Ben? Yes, hello, uh, Professor. Nice to meet you uh, in this uh, special day for Chinese for the last day of the Year of the Tiger. And thank you very much for sharing your experience. And uh, congratulate on your results on the management of the spinal um, angioblastoma. So my uh, question is that, uh, um, uh, do you have experience for some uh, quite extensive uh, hemangioblastoma in uh, VHL patients that you need to consider, um, uh, you need to do an extensive uh, laminectomy or even a, a, a facetectomy that you need to do the spinal fusion at the same time. So okay. in your case series, do you have any experience on that? So thank you, Professor Ben. Uh, in our cases, we just, uh, we have got some cases of the, about 19 cases of VHL disease patients. And uh, for just as mentioned in the case four, uh, we have got the patient in the two, uh, two hemangiobras lesions in the cervical. So we resect two, both of them at one stage because the mm -hmm. patient is very young, about 25 years old. So we just tell her to do the follow up. Uh, one stage, once the surgery, to just a laminectomy, not mm -hmm. to do the uh, fusion. Maybe mm -hmm. she will perform the fusion in the next in the next uh, in the following years uh, mm. two years later or maybe three years later and uh, we have occurred for some more extensive cases some people have uh, four or more than four lesions in the spinal cranial spinal part so we just remove the the biggest one and uh, mm. about the adjacent one uh, with the laminectomy and the other of them we can use uh, if they are very small we just tell her to do the follow-up and 
some patients may go to do the SIS as well. If the symptom becomes very obvious, uh, maybe uh, microsurgery is the first choice. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, we do, uh, do encounter cases that uh, when you have a uh, multiple hemangiobarsoma uh, uh, that we move via a laminectomy, some patient might, for example, especially cervicals, mm -hmm. when they open multiple level, there are some patients who develop uh, kyphosis after the yeah. after uh, the surgery uh, several years later. That might eventually be quite fusion. Another question is about the embolization. So I can see that uh, you you um, are embolized for some cases. So uh, how would you select uh, those patients for embolization? Uh, is will the location of the uh, lesion, either for example the cervical or thoracic, or even lumbar, will make uh, any differences in your in your decision making whether uh, you choose embolization or not? Thank you. Uh, embolization uh, maybe for just uh, was performed uh, mainly in the cervical, cervical part and uh, which were uh, close to the medulla oblongata for two reasons. Uh, the first one is the the, the location uh, adhere to the medulla oblongata. The feeding arteries may be different from the other part. For yes. example, the thoracic one and almost also the lumbar one. The, we can easily go, go to, to embolize them. And mm. uh, for the spinal ones, you, can, you may use some very complicated super selective catheterization and it is much uh, hard to, to embolize them. Mm. And uh, the, other, the other consideration is about the volume, volume of the tumor. Yes. Especially the solid part, the solid classification, the tumor is very, you, there's no cyst and no cylindrical myelium with the totally intramedullary hematomas. For this kind of tumor, we may recommend you to embrace them. Yeah, ju just the last uh, question. Uh, yeah, would you, uh, uh, in your routine practice, would you perform the embolization and surgery on the same day? Not same day. Not same day. First, how, how, many, uh, how many? About days? one day later. One day later. Yes. Okay. I see. And thank you so much and congratulate on your excellent result. Thank you and happy Chinese New Year. Yeah, happy Chinese New Year. Well, thank you. And uh, that was a very crispy uh, presentation. Kabibolo, would you like to ask something? I would like to ask thanks to both speakers for excellent presentation. So uh, in this case, uh, I'll present in my main case of spine and then give us to farmers. So in our case, we had um, uh, some cases in the posterior fossa and is in a cerebral hemisphere. So in which uh, material you use uh, to embolize uh, property as a property of embol embolization procedure? As you mentioned, it, it, you perform it the day before. The so, day before. Yes, uh, according uh, to your opinion, I think is, uh, which is the average time between embolization and the surgical procedures? So is there exact time, um, at least a maximum or minimum time, days maybe? So thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we just use uh, the onyx to embrace the feeding artery of the hemorrhagic of the in the spinal cord and uh, as well as the cranial ones. And but uh, just as I mentioned before, the for spinal ones, you you the because the uh, artery and anatomy, a feeding artery of the spine is different from the uh, cranial ones, so uh, it is very much hard for them to embrace of all the hematoblastomas, and uh, we just we usually perform the embracation if uh, the day before. Uh, before the microsurgery, about 24 hours. And then 
to avoid the spinal uh, uh, edema. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very important point asked by Kavibulo. Uh, I think with that, we will uh, wind this up. If Professor Kinoshita is here, would you like to ask something, Professor Kinoshita? No, um, I, I, I usually don't do spine surgery. So um, your presentation was very uh, informative for me. I do hemangioblastoma in the cerebrum, cerebrum. So yeah. uh, with those uh, tumors without cysts, it's sometimes yeah. very difficult if you have the tumor um, extending yeah. so, into uh, the medulla or the brainstem. And, and we do, yeah. we use embolization also. But um, because, as you know, uh, it is very challenging to embolize only the tumor and not the brainstem. <laughs> so yeah. um, very difficult cases. Um, thank you very much. It was very uh, uh, a, le a lecture for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll wind this up today. I'll close this webinar officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both the speakers of today. Professor uh, Manabu Kinoshita and Professor Gu and Tao, as well as the chair, Professor Faris Chadad Nato, for the time and support for the ACNS webinar. Sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar and also delivering us a special New Year message. And he has just messaged us that as of now, we are joined by around 375 people live on this New Year's Eve of Chinese New Year. Thank you very much. And thanks for my co-host uh, Ben and Kabibullo for joining me today. So until we meet online on the 28th of January, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.